All right, gentlemen, welcome again to a, a little late edition of the BGO Blind Pig. Normally, we, we, we record these on Wednesday night, but being as it's a bye week, there was some flexibility needed from a couple members of the, of the team here, so we moved it to Thursday. Figure we're not up against it. Um, for those watching at home, uh, you got top left, that's Bob, known as Neo. Bottom left is Paul, the Canadian hog. Bottom right is Ohm, also known as Mark. And then top right is Boone, also known as John. And I'm Derek, silent threat on the board. So if you want to jump on, please feel free to engage. And once again, tell us what we do or don't know about what we're talking about. We're making a big sacrifice tonight because we're we're literally missing the electric sounds and and sights of uh, the Colts versus the Jets. So oh, I got yeah, it on worse. in the background. I got it on back here. I'll let you know. I got the Caps happens. game on, but I think Make I'm going to sure switch break it in off. with any exciting developments. Mike, Mike White, the legend in New York, Mike White has come back to earth pretty quick here tonight so far. Now you got my intrigue. So, you, so you're telling me it's a good thing I didn't pick the Jets in the Survivor Pool this week. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I cannot say anything about Survivor Pools. I was out after, I think I was out after four weeks or five weeks with all yeah, three lives. Yeah, but you lives. forgot half of those weeks, Mark. <laughs> no, no, not this year. I, I was so proud of myself. I actually played and, and still lost it. I overthought them. So there's a reason I don't play those games very often. So anyway, I would be remiss if I didn't didn't repeat the question that I asked to the to the gallery here as I was getting ready to hit record and say um you know what do we want to talk about are we gonna there's not a lot of positive uh for lack of a better term of course there was a little bit more colorful language in my original question but um I, I guess what we can do is look back a little bit we got to buy so maybe we can look forward a little bit John said he's got something on the radar that nobody is completely aware of so that could be interesting. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and throw something out there instead of pooping on the team for the better part of an hour. I will say that once again, the defense did everything they possibly could to win this football game, including hand the ball back in the red, in positive territory with less than a minute to go down by one score. And we could not convert. Uh, it's like the offense got off the same page and the defense started to get on it um this was a team that we weren't supposed to fear but had a decent defense and an offense that can run the football and for lack of a better term we did everything we could to win and the offense just didn't show up that's three yeah, straight weeks fact, i think one factor in their defense um this is probably the only thing in their defense i'll say uh, we've taken a big hit on the O-line and, um, you know, I, I was looking at some stats and I, I thought it was amusing because uh, the Washington PR department usually posts a official post-game stat packet and they didn't even bother this week. <laughs> it's like, I mean, well, they, they also misspelled they their name, but I think one thing to just to keep in mind um, is that the O-line has been be really beat up the last few weeks. And of course we lost, Rulier, which is, um, that's a big hit, but, uh, and just as evidence of that, you know, we had, I think one, we averaged like one sack, uh, on Heineke, the first, uh, six games. And then the last two weeks we've had nine sacks. So that just shows you, I mean, it's rough back there <laughs> and that's not to give him a pass in any, by any stretch or anyone else on the offense. But I just think, you know, and, and again, it seems like it, last year was kind of the exception, uh, of having just epic injuries it, where it's kind of starting to happen now. And I know, I know what everyone's out there will say, which is all teams have injuries and Denver was riddled with injuries for God's sake. We talked about their linebacker core. I think the last, the last pot about how decimated they were and how we should feast on their linebacker core. And they look just fine really <laughs> for the most part. So, but I do think that's having a big effect at a, at a, at, and it's putting a lot of pressure on a guy who hasn't doesn't have a lot of experience uh, and doesn't have a lot of playmakers to bail him out right now. Um, other than, you know, Terry McLaurin and even Gibson is struggling um, a little bit. So here's, here's my rebut to that. 
we had two drives down on the one yard line against the Packers and didn't get any points out of either one of them. Had we gotten two field goals out of those two drives, it's an eight point game with the ball with multiple minutes to go. This game, we had two failed field goal conversions. Am I remembering correctly? I will admit it was Halloween. I was walking around with my kids and I was a little bit under the influence by the time we got to the second half. Two blocks. Two blocked field goals and a failed fourth down conversion and Bobby McCain dropped an interception on plus territory. So none of that had to do with injury, right? I mean, I'm not giving well, the injury. Obviously the injuries matter, but, yeah, but it, that does, it does have to do with injury because you've got one wide receiver. That's a true starting NFL wide receiver out there on this true. team. That's and, it. And he's getting double and triple team. So when you have a Curtis Samuel, a guy that can be a game changer and he hasn't played a, significant series yet on on healthy legs that's a big deal and I mean I'm not making excuses I, I believe me I'm not I'm just saying it doesn't it's help a factor us that, it doesn't help us that we're banged up well, it's so a factor it might not two, be the reason two thoughts. two thoughts on this one you cannot minimize the injuries on this team let's let's face it we weren't <clears> starting <throat> from a all pro bowl squad to begin with right we couldn't afford to lose a lot of starters we knew that going in According to Kime, by the end of the game on Sunday, we were we had three remaining opening day starters playing on offense. Three out of 11. So when you start ticking that down, that includes, by the way, QB1, right? It was mm-hmm. never supposed to be Taylor Heineke. Tight w, end one. Tight end one, wide receiver two, RT1, RG1, C1. Yeah. They're all out and other guys. And Gibson, I think I was talking to John about this during the game. Gibson ain't right. He's not playing at full speed. So those are a lot of injuries, even for a really good team to overcome. Mm-hmm. For one that was starting sort of in the middle of the pack to begin with, it was too much. All of that said, in, in this Denver game, for instance, um, we went up and down the field again. We had positive stats, right? We outgained them in total yards. We outgained them in passing yards, rushing yards, uh, time of possession, and we had multiple red zone opportunities again. So to me, it's kind of glaring. The same thing happened against the Packers. We, we are playing decent defense now, and we're moving the ball between the 20s creatively and efficiently. And we get down in the red zone and some combination of the plays that are being called and the execution is just killing us down deep. Now that, that shouldn't be a surprise to people who watch the NFL, right? The red zone is hard. The field is compressed. The defenses are compressed. You know what? My strongest feeling still is that we've got a quarterback that can't make those spectacular throws in tight spots in the end zone late in games. That that's what big time NFL quarterbacks do. I don't think we have that. Um, And there's just, I don't think they really have a solid plan when they get down inside in the red zone in that compressed area about what they're going to do. We, you know, we were, we lost by a score. We had multiple chances. We We call plays. We just feel really tight. We get down in the red zone. It's like, you can almost feel like the panic. (laughs) And and what what we don't see is, I'm I'm sorry, I know I'm, I'm rambling on, but, but I was commenting on this during the game too. Where we get down into, uh, it's sometimes it's on short yardage anywhere in the field, but in the red zone in particular, we are not drilling it into the end zone on little slants. And that we are going to the flats and we are trying to run a sort of timing stuff where Taylor's on his back foot backpedaling. They're not attacking the end zone at all. And I agree, that's tight and seems like a little bit timid. And that might be because Scott Turner doesn't isn't convinced that his guy can make those plays or I mean, I don't know. But there, there's the big issue with the team. It's the red zone. Well, if you're not convinced your guy can make those plays, why do you keep putting the ball in his hands? Well, yeah. what's the alternative right now? Or taking it out. He's, he's a half yard slide away from scrambling for a touchdown against Green Bay. And we didn't see that look again. I don't get it. And we're playing yeah. against the, yeah. the Broncos, whose entire linebacking core is depleted. So you know I they think, don't have the speed. I think it would feel less. It would make us less insane if we were if we were pounding the ball, pounding the ball, pounding the ball, and still losing. Um, you know, even Jarrett Patterson finally was. You started to see a little bit of production from him. I just, I think, I do agree with Bob that they, they, and I, I like this in a way, but I hate it in a way. And that's that they, they seem to have and an excessive confidence in Heineke 
uh, because he does have those flashes where he looks like he can just make something out of nothing. But he he really isn't a very experienced quarterback, and and they know that he's prone to make bonehead plays at the worst possible time. So kind of putting it all on his shoulders. I know that you want a quarterback that you can put it all on his shoulders, but I just think at some point you might have to acknowledge that he's not that guy yet and or, or and may never be. But um, So yeah. what's, what's a quarterback's best friend? A good running game. Correct. And it doesn't necessarily have to be handing the ball off. Those first That first drive against Denver, McKissick was torching that defense, and it wasn't even funny. And then it, it, he just disappears for, for a quarter and a half. Like I said, against Green Bay in the red zone, Heineke has a boot, something John's been screaming for for weeks, has the boot run pass option. And the only reason it's not a touchdown is because he went down too early. But why are, why don't we see that against the Broncos when they don't have their entire linebacking core, when you can beat the D line to the end, when Von Miller's on the sidelines? What do they? What is, what's the famous thing? Find the hole and you attack it. Uh, not having Von Miller's a pretty big hole. You know what I mean? And I didn't see that, and that's why McKissick looked like he did in the beginning of that game. I think is because the linebacking core wasn't there. But then we just went away from it. I put the analogy when we were talking. It was in the chat. It, it's like that quarterback whose fastball is working, but he wants to win with the curve, so he abandons it simply because that's how he wants to win the game. So hey, I mean, you, we we have this we have this conversation every week. I'd mm-hmm. I'd like to see somebody break down what what the actual play calls were in the red zone. I, I if I had time, I would have I would have tried to do it to see what what do we actually do as opposed to what does it sort of look like and feel like. What kind of defense or defenses are we going up again? If there's nine guys in the box, are you still going to pound it into the middle? No. On no, third I'm going to do a pitch sweep or a boot, a play action boot. Let mm-hmm. Heineke get to the corner. I, I you know, I all right. He, Gibson is Gibson's not full speed, but even not full speed, he can beat the Broncos linebackers that are all guys that were walking the street to start the season. You know, now, I, all right, I had, I mean, this is, I, I beat this drum last week, but without the thought that I had tonight while we were talking about injuries, maybe Turner doesn't have short yardage confidence in the backups that are playing on the offensive line. You know, I mean, we opened the season talking about the fact that Brandon Scherf is an all pro. He's the only all pro we've had since Matt Turk, right? Matt, that was, you know, I've had two kids since then. <laughs> it, yeah, and one of them's about to be driving. So I was gonna say you've had you've had two right? kids, and they've probably gotten to high school at this point, right? I, well, I've got I've had two kids since then, and the oldest one's in high school. Yeah, and, and, but I still don't understand why you have six shots at the end zone inside the two against Green Bay, and every single one of them is a pass. I don't. I, I yeah. Now, granted, I didn't see the stand against Denver, and I haven't had the stomach to go watch that game. I'm going to be really square with everybody there. Um, I I didn't get it, and I'm kind of glad I didn't get it and sit through it at this point in time because I really thought we were going to win this. I felt really good about this last week, Um, and we all know how that turned out now. But I'm just looking at the statistics, and I don't understand how we don't give – Patterson or Gibson, both of whom are averaging over four yards a carry in this game, shots inside the five. Well, and McKissick, McKissick can run the ball from the backfield. They don't use him that way very often, especially to the edges. But he can. I mean, there have been times when Gibson got dinged up and had to be out for a series, and he he can run the ball up the gut. He really can. Um, but they just, I, I do think they underutilize him. And I also think, you know, I wouldn't want to, if you're going to run the ball, you're basically running it left at this point because you don't want to run behind Sadiq Charles. Um, We figured that out. And that guy, I don't know what to say about him, but he just looks like he doesn't belong in the NFL right now. And um, I was hoping he was going to come out. There's a big opportunity for him. And he just, to me, he looked terrible. I I don't know. Did they play him at tackle or at guard, John? I think he was in a tackle. He went in behind Leno, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he was playing right tackle. Here, here's what I want to know. So I'm hearing you guys go back and forth um, in regards to our team 
not necessarily having an answer in red zone. We also talked about the significant injury concerns. We clearly don't right now have a solid plan in the red zone. So I don't want to make this a dump fest on Ron Rivera because I really do like the guy and I love him and I'm fully confident that I think he's the type of guy we need to turn this around. But given all these struggles that we're having in the red zone, we don't seem to have an answer with our plays. We have injury concerns. Why are we refusing points in the red zone lately? Um, yes. that, that, that Denver game, for instance, fourth and one on the 19 on our first drive, it was the first time defensively where we finally made a team punt in our first drive. We have an opportunity to put up points and we don't do it, you know, for, for, for an offense that's struggling. I think that little things like that could be a momentum builder. Um, and, and it's got to be crushing for some of these guys to be going up and down the field and coming away empty every single time. I think at some point, you just got to put the points on the board and try to build off that. And we've all seen games where teams that didn't deserve to win the game win the game because they took the easy points when they were there. You know what I'm saying? They did not play the other team, but they they just accumulated enough points on the on the scoreboard to win. And I, I don't want to beat on this because I know you can argue it any way you want, but getting rid of Dustin Hopkins for a guy that was on the street. Um, I, I said at the time, I thought that was a knee jerk and it was probably like, I don't know why he did it. I hope he didn't do it to appease the fans. I don't think he's that kind of a coach No. and I get why he did it, but I just think, you know, kicker and he, he's, like I said last week, he he even acknowledged kickers go through rough stretches. And when a good kicker goes through a rough stretch, you'll usually regret cutting that guy. And we've seen that in Washington before. We've done that before. And, I, and some people will say, well, Dustin Hopkins, not a good kicker. He was a pretty good. He's certainly a lot better kicker than what we've seen over the last two weeks. So, But that plays into the whole thing, which is, okay, now you've got a kicker that you don't trust for, for anything – Mm -hmm. So are you going for the 40 yard field goal when you have the chance now? I don't know. Are you, or are you not? Well, that's kind and of Ron. I mean, he's riverboat Ron, right? He goes for it on fourth down. My, my knee jerk reaction at the time. And I looking back on it, I don't, I don't think I've come off of that. I had less of a problem with them going for it there than on what they chose to run to go for it. They run a little flare pass out to the, to the flat, three yards behind the line of scrimmage on a fourth and one to a guy going, not a guy ready to go forward to a guy going laterally. Yeah. It just, that play had little or no chance to work to me. I, I was really okay with them going for it there because we're really good in the red zone. And I'm sure we would just would have pounded it right in after that. See, it, and just I, and smacked I, of, it smacked of desperation a little bit to me because nine times out of 10, you're in, you're, you're inside the 40. You, I mean, you're looking at a 40, 45 yard field goal. You take it. You don't, you don't like get cute and try to. That wasn't it. even that. We were the 19, right? Yeah. That, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I got to mention one. You're talking thing. sub 30 at that point. I thought this was funny. Um, one of my buddies on Twitter, Ash Burning is his 40. name. He's a, at Johnny Local on Twitter. He said, mm -hmm. We've got Blew It. Now we need to sign Screw It. Because <laughs> 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 that's where we are with this season. I, I thought it was funny anyway. You know, and I, so, you know, I mean, I watch the film and I watch guys, I forget the guy on Twitter that, that does all the, all the breakdowns and, you know, Mark you Bullock. Go, is it yeah, Bullock? Bullock? Right. Yeah. Some of that Who, stuff it, is brilliant, right? I'm, I'm not that guy. I don't, you know, I, I can't sit there and watch film and break everything down and know what was trying to, what was happening where. And I mean, obviously our play design, pretty solid. Hold on, can I, for what he breaks down, we've got guys breaking open. We've got guys flashing open and doing all this stuff all over the field. And so the play design seems to me to be pretty solid. Is it possible that we've got a guy that knows how to design games, but not call games? I mean, I'm going to keep hammering it where he calls them pretty good until we get down to the red zone. And then for whatever reason, it falls apart. Yeah. And I don't know. I can't tell Bob if it's, some combination of Turner's calling and, and the execution of the players. I, I would really like to, this is kind of silly, but I'd love to see what Scott Turner would do with, well, with a veteran, if, if Fitzpatrick doesn't get hurt, what are we, are we talking about the red zone? Like we're talking about it now? Um, I don't know. I think, I think, I think the bigger question is if Logan Thomas doesn't get hurt, that's, that's we talking about the red zone. That's a big part of it. 
I, but I, it's not like it's not like Seals Jones is dropping stuff. No, but he's, no, not, I, he's yeah. Not well, where's the where's the fade? Remember week one or we, was it week one or week two that Logan Thomas Heineke threw the ball nine feet in the air and Logan Thomas went up and got it. it there was, was the defender Logan? wasn't getting it. it. There was no. It's you either Logan Thomas. Huh? I thought that was Seals Jones. No, I'm he, talking. He made like, one. He made one against the Giants. I think it was in the, the Giants. opener. Logan Thomas went and made one at the back of the end zone that we haven't had a tight end make that play ever. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, his head could have hit the goalpost if he was standing close enough to it. I, I, I think nobody nobody wants to denigrate Ricky Seals Jones. I think he's been uh, a godsend that he's given us a viable tight end option, but he's not Logan Thomas. Mm-hmm. So Some, somebody uh, posted on Twitter, I thought this was an interesting thought, which is if we had gotten Matt Stafford, would we be two and six right now? No, I don't think so. Um, and I, I do think it's something to consider. And we've talked before about, I mean, everyone's talked about this, that we probably got a little lulled into, you know, we probably uh, bought into the hype last at the end of last year uh, with the de- defense looking how it looked and getting to the playoffs and, giving the Bucks a game in the playoffs and Heineke's play. Uh, we probably bought into that too much and we, and I'm sure we did, but um, maybe we're just not that good. I mean, I know no one wants to consider that, but every team, every team, like everyone thinks their Antonio Gibson is the second coming of uh, Adrian Peterson, or, you know what I'm saying? We have players that we like a lot, but maybe they're just pretty good. They're not. Here's, great. here's my response. To that. And John, you and I went, we went on Twitter about this because the question got posed talking about the Monday night game. And they said, I think it was the Monday night game. It might have been, I don't know, it was Green Bay was in the game. And they said, watching this game with Green Bay, and you can really tell how far away Washington is. And my response was, take Aaron Rodgers and drop him on Washington. And we're not that far away anymore. And I'm not saying I'm advocating for Aaron Rodgers, but the simple point is, if you have an all pro quarterback who's an MVP in the league, it makes up for a hell of a lot of things that are going on. This team with that kind of quarterback is contending. And you can't tell me that's not. Well, I've been, hell, I've, you guys are singing my language. I've been arguing that on the internet for 25 years that so, a, a quarterback lifts, that he's the rising tide that lifts all boats. Um, what would have been interesting but I to think see both things- with, with a guy like Matt Stafford here is whether or not the defense would have collapsed the first six weeks like it did, if that would have I had think, an effect on the both, rest of the team. I think both things can be true, though. I think we can acknowledge that maybe this team isn't anywhere near as good as we hoped it would be. But if we had a really a, a top-tier quarterback, it would look a lot better. I think both Absolutely. of those things are true. 100%. We all, everybody Absolutely. on here picked us to win double-digit games this year. And we're one game away from that becoming a legitimate impossibility. Obviously, we're not going to win double-digit games this year. And I think it all feeds off each – it feeds off of each other. When you have a quarterback that does score from the two-yard line, that does make an amazing play or just a competent play, then that lifts the whole team up. When you have defensive backs that don't have balls hit them in the chest that and you bounce, and I yeah. could rumble down the field with and drops it, at, I mean, at critical junctures of the game – that that makes the offense that fires the offense up. It all goes hand in hand, and we just make so many mistakes, and we fail at crucial times. And I think it's just it's just it, we just get overwhelmed with it. You know, I'm I'm sitting here looking at the at the scores on the games this year. The Saints game wasn't nearly as ugly as the score indicates. It's three plays. It's the hail plays. mary, and it's three plays that our defense just went to sleep on. We're not talking anything really complex here. Nobody made any brilliant moves on the part of the Saints. Guys just gave up on coverage or didn't cover at all. And Jameis Winston with his big damn arm went downfield and hit the guy that was standing alone somewhere. You know, the 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 Chiefs game, we played really well right up until the final 15, 16, 17 minutes. And I think you could argue that if the offense does its job a little better in the first half, we don't care how many points we give up in the second half. But again, the defense just kind of went to sleep in the fourth quarter. The unit, none of us expected to be a problem. I'm going to pose this question. See, see if you guys have the answer to this. How many games this year in our eight games, how many times have we outgained the opponent? Take a Yards. Guess. 
Yes. Total yards? I'm going to guess. Probably, I, I would probably say five of the eight. Yeah, exactly. five or six. It, five. Exactly. F five of the eight games, we've outgained our opponent. The fact is, as you guys have alluded to, complementary football completely evades this football team. It's been doing it for eight weeks this year. It's been doing it season after season. You know, we have a little bit of a rally from our offense. Our defense stumbles and vice versa. It's just it's it's a never ending cycle, it seems. Have we had one? I mean, I mean, you mentioned the Chiefs game, which I thought was a pretty good effort with with some small exceptions. But have we have we really had a game this year where like all three units showed up? And when I say showed up, I mean, just played well without like the whole game totally imploding. No. Not through no, the not whole game. Four quarters. Mm -hmm. Not for four quarters now. But you know that that's the NFL. No, but that's not the way it works, really. I mean, we're gonna I'm gonna beat it to death, I guess, tonight. But if this team is even middle of the pack in red zone efficiency, we're mm -hmm. one game four under four. 500. You know, we're we're playing a whole different brand of football. It's hard to it's hard to over over exaggerate how poor we've been in the red zone on offense. We and that goes to what Paul was just saying. We we we're going up and down the field offensively. We can't uh, score even in the Chiefs game which we're feeling like we played well and we scored 13 points. Wasn't Denver worse than us in the red zone? That's the part that killed me in this game because they were not a better team. We no. should have won that game and you could see it throughout the game that it in most areas we were a more talented team, but we just kept shooting ourselves in the foot. And those those last two possessions, right? We're going to tie the game up. If we make our two field goals and they'll get them blocked, all we need is a field goal there, by the way. But mm -hmm. by then we've got three of our projected eleven starters on the field trying to trying to win a game at the end. Well, if you really if you even want to go further, if we don't get two blocked and then fail on fourth and short inside the red zone, we have a lead with the ball at the end of the game. If nothing else changes, you know, if we could fix the red zone on offense and 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 we don't even have to be great well i think mark just said it right if we were what mediocre middle yeah. of the pack right and just middle just middle of the pack if we could fix that and we can fix the big play on defense this team is five and three and, and we're I think, having a completely different discussion tonight and arguably over the last couple of weeks at least the defense seems to have solved some of those problems with they're not giving up the big gashing plays they're Not, getting the quarterback too. And they're getting some pressure and you know they held a team to 17. Um, eight. I looked this up eight teams, won games this week, giving up 17 or more. We gave up 17, you know, you're supposed to win that game. Uh, very few teams win with 10 points. Very few. Well, now that, now that injuries are starting to hit the defense, I mean, it looks like we're going to be missing sweat for four weeks with a, with a busted jaw. Yep. I don't know when that happened during this game. He his his stat line this weekend totally jumped right off the page at me, though. He had goose eggs all the way across the board except for quarterback hits. He had two hits, but no tackles, no sacks, no nothing. So I don't know how long he played, but so I know I know I'm a Marine and everything, but it crossed my mind like wire that thing up <laughs> and get <laughs> back at it. Week. Get out there and what does your I mean, jaw have to do with you hitting somebody? Like, just remove the jaw. I don't need the jaw. You, I can <laughs> you know, Ronnie, Ronnie Lott and cut off his pinky. That's probably desperation uh, talking. So I'm, I'm really no, not. I think I think that was growing up as a football fan in the 70s and 80s, John. It, it, that they would have uh, done that back in the day. Not not today, my friend. Wasn't this it? Was wasn't a, it hacksaw? Hacksaw that like oh my fingers a uh, mangle, so just cut it off. No, that was Ronnie. Lock Lock. Cut off. Like Lock. Lock. Lock was saying, a hacksaw played on a broken leg. Here's the thing, John. Think leg. about it this way, though. If we win this football game, is he is he pushing through that? If we're three and four or three and Three and five. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, two and six, and, and Dallas is walking away with the division. It's pretty much a loss. It, was, the it really almost, does feel like scared of getting vaccinated. I'm not sure he's going to go get his jaw wired up to play. I don't know if anyone else had this thought this week, but I literally walked into work and someone's like, How'd it go on Sunday? And I'm like, It's November. And, and the we're, season's our over. season is over. Yeah. How, I'm just so tired of that. Oh my God. It's, I mean, you know, it's just brutal. 
And it's not over, are, but it is over. We know it's over. Oh, hey, how about that draft pick? What do you think? <laughs> Hold on. To that point, to that point, because I had this conversation a little bit this past week, and it's if we want to really pull back the curtain a little bit and take a take a larger macro look at this team, this is about where we're supposed to be. Had we not bought into the hype in the offseason? Had we not That's bought into the number there. five defense in the league? Had we not bought into the if, – if the offense can be middle of the pack and the defense can be the top five defense they're supposed to be, we could win 11. Hold on. We were 3-13 and 13 when Rivera and company walked into this building. He's had two drafts. He has not even touched a quarterback, a long-term solution to quarterback. So how, how, how unrealistic is two and six? Well, the is that really that, a letdown? The counter to that, Derek, is nobody expected. I, I think, and I'll go back and check the tape, but I don't think that, that I expected us to be a top two or three defense, but I did expect us to be top 10. I didn't expect us to fall off a cliff. Fair. And that to me is the big but, sort of question mark about 2021 so far is what exactly happened the first half of the season on defense? Well, I guess I guess the other the other question I was pose, kind of posing without posing it is, is this where Rivera thought we would be through eight games in 2021? No, he didn't expect his defense to fall apart either. He didn't expect to be starting Tyler Taylor Heineke, and much as I love the guy, um, no, he did not. Uh, I, I think he probably suspected that we'd be able to hang around 500 and make a push if we were all healthy. But, I mean, you can't look at our season so far without looking at who's playing at quarterback, A, or A, and then 1A would be 1A would be the defense. Those, those are the two things that I were completely un, un, unable to predict things that have happened to us so far. And, and honestly – there are teams out there with first round draft picks playing at quarterback who would love to be getting as much production out of those first round draft picks as we're getting out of an undrafted 28 year old guy that's playing on his fourth or fifth team now. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sitting here watching the Jets tonight, and with the exception of one game, they'd take Heineke over White all season long. Well, they're waiting for our, their man Wilson to come back that they invested the franchise in. Mark made a really excellent point a while ago, which is, and what he was talking about is margin of error. And we just don't have any margin of error. And so, and the point I'm making is if Heineke, if our defense was playing at a similar level as last year, if we didn't lose Logan Thomas and, and we weren't decimated on the O-line and all those other things that we've talked about, then we might be able to overcome his his inexperienced mistakes and bonehead mistakes at times, um, and That's fair and thrive on what he does well. But we just don't have that. There's no buffer. There's no tolerance um, built into this team. It's like we have to be pretty damn good every week to have a chance and and healthy, right? We couldn't we couldn't survive the kind of injuries we had. Yeah, but I, John, I think that was always going to be the case this year. We were always, we were always going to be the team that that had to play fairly mistake-free football. We're not, we're not Kansas City, where Patrick Mahomes can give the ball up three times in the first half and somehow miraculously throw for four hundred yards in a game and win it. You know, hey, and I mean, even and we're finding out this year, even Patrick Mahomes, it can't overcome everything. <laughs> I mean. <right. clears throat> So, yeah, I think you're right about that. You know, I mean, we, we, we always had to play fairly mistake-free football. We're not doing that. But I, I don't know. I just – I'm, I'm really watching time. Rivera down the stretch here because I think a lot of coaches would – they would not be able to sustain, you know, positivity and commitment on the play, with the players and a buy-in and all of that. I think Rivera will, but, um, and we probably underappreciate that. Because he's a pros pro, he may not be, he may not be the greatest coach of all time, but he's a pros pro, and he's not going to let the players uh, give up. Um, I have plenty of faith in Rivera. I'll tell you where my faith has taken a hit, and my faith has taken a hit in Rivera's ability to bring in assistant coaches and coordinators that I have faith in. I'm losing my faith in Jack Del Rio. Scott Turner has never managed to instill any faith in me, and he's not doing much this year. I mean, yeah. He's doing great stuff between the twenties, but I'm sorry. If you're not putting points on the board, is the offensive coordinator doing his job? Last I checked, you don't get W's for most yards. 
You get W's for and most points. There was a play in figuring the- out how to put the ball in the end zone. And, you know, and to go back to the defensive side of the ball, I am struggling to understand why we let some of these guys walk that did such a great job for us last year. And, and what we're doing, you know, why, why, why did it take so many weeks to, to put Landon Collins down in the box the way every fan I know knows where, where Landon Collins plays best? He's not a free safety. You don't play him at the back of the formation. You play him at the front of the formation. And yet it took five or six weeks for our defensive staff to go, we're going to play him as a small linebacker. I don't, I don't understand that. I understand why Reeves is on the practice squad and not playing. He and DeShazer Everett and Curl did great things the end of last year. I, I, I just I don't understand why, why Darby and everybody's favorite, uh, Moorhead, Jimmy, Jimmy, are Moreland. on other rosters this year. Moreland. Moreland, that's it. Yeah, I wanted to say Moorhead, but I don't understand why they're on other rosters. I'm not, I'm not understanding. Well, remember heading faith in their ability to do that to handle this stuff heading into the season though that wasn't the prevailing wisdom out there the prevailing wisdom was that we had aggressively tried to upgrade the secondary by going after jackson and landing him. Mean, he was a premier signing that everyone was cheering about i mean i didn't know enough it sounded like it sounded good to me i sort of assume that you assume that the coaches know what they're doing and personnel does it goes we'll, the we'll conversation say, ends with him being the best man-to-man coverage on the free agent market and watching him get torched in zone. It's Josh Norman all over again. Yeah, well, we continue to play in zone, man, even I'm though we're not good that. at it. I mean, it, he's had a rough start. I think that's fair, but as did the whole defense. learning a new system. I, I, I think we're, we're too quick to, you know, uh, bail on people, give them a chance. I'm not, he, I'm not he, bailing on him. I'm saying we're not using gonna, him right. I'm, I'm saying, bailing, yeah, I'd I'm saying I'm we're not using players. him the right way. I'm, I'm saying, I don't, you yeah. know, I, I, I watch, I mean, and, it, and it's on both sides of the ball. I watch Heineke every week. We're playing to Heineke's strengths between the twenties, but once we get inside the 20, we seem to forget what Heineke's strengths are. When, so and, let me ask the question. Just, I'm sorry. No, go for it. Well, I have to ask the question is, is, at what point is it on Turner and where, where's the dividing line? When, when is it the players and when is it the coaches and what's being called? Because one can equally argue, Hey, you execute the play that's called. If the guy's there and the options there, the player has to make it happen. If, if the player doesn't, I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? It's easy to, right. well, here, to here's my, here's, here's my response to that. Mark is we're asking Heineke to make throws. He can't throw. He's not making the throws. He's not making the throws. He's because because he can't he make it. That they, that's think, my I point. Think we assume that we know what he was asked to do, and that's what Mark. That's fair. Was but you, you know, like, we know what the play. We don't know what the play was called. We don't know what the players were supposed to do on that okay, play. So here's, it's, a here's more, a, it's a lot more than watching it on TV. Well, no, Derek wants to run the ball, and John Bob wants to. No, run the no, ball, no. He likes to run the ball. Too, I don't. If, if I don't want do to it. run the ball. Here's an example. I watched Terry McLaurin get his head taken off this past weekend. Because on an out route, because the the throw Heineke's got a weak arm in NFL standards. He throws the ball a mile further than I can throw it. I'm not going to act like he, I'm any better, but comparative to a lot of the quality and high end quarterbacks in the league, his arm isn't at the same level. Well, I watched a play this past weekend where McLaurin got his head taken off because the ball took so long to get to the outside because we had two receivers in the same area. Huh? <laughs> I think it, I think Derek was getting ready to say he got his head taken off. I don't know what happened. I can hear you guys, but you guys aren't moving. I don't either. That's that's. Hmm. I wonder if this whole thing's gonna. Cry. Oh wait, he moved. <laughs> now we're back. You're locked up on us there for about ten All seconds, right. bro. So he, McLaurin got his. I could hear everything you guys were saying, but you guys froze. <laughs> So uh, apparently my internet's unstable. So maybe it just I'm, I'm getting censored. Dan Snyder hacked my what computer. Did Scott Turner install it for you? You don't, yeah, you, don't have the chickens in, you don't have the chickens in the control room again, do you? No, no, they're outside now. <laughs> but my point my point is that we watch Heineke fail, not fail. We watch Heineke throw a short ball on a wheel route in the red zone and give up the same play on multiple weeks. We we see you said but Mark Bullock was was breaking down the film and, and guys were getting schemed open 
but what are, are like are those throws that Heineke can make? They flash on the outside, but the ball takes forever to get there. A good coach, and I'm not faulting. I just I wonder how much flexibility Turner has of adjusting the offense to fit the ability of his quarterback, or is he in the film room saying it was open? Heineke couldn't throw the ball there. You know what I'm saying? And or he that's where him. I think that's another big factor. He and, and that's fair. So why is he the fifth read and not the first? You know what I'm saying? Like where where's the where's the balance there? Where where where's the conversation? Where's where's the the coaching and where is it that this is my system? My system is working. You're not executing my system well enough, and I'm not going to change it because it's there. You can't be that way as a as a leader, as a coach, as anybody. If anybody's managed anybody in the world, you know you know sometimes you got to change things to fit the personnel you have, and not the other way around. Yeah, but um, Scott Turner is the son of what we do works. Oh, come on. That's not fair. That's is it not? not? Oh, come no, on, it's man. not. Why is it's that not. not fair? Because he's his own man. He's an NFL. He may not be a great coordinator, it's, it's but he's also, early. look what he's working with. North Turner worked. I mean, he, he came up with, with Troy Aikman, for God's sake, who could make any throw on the planet. That And... I think he's, yep. Norv was a pretty good offensive coordinator. He just was a terrible head coach. No, you're I just, absolutely right. Yeah. I, what's I think interesting to right, me it's, is... It's fair to ask the question, which is it? Is it execution or is it that we're not... The coaching, the calls are not, you know, taking advantage of what our players can do. I think those are fair questions, but I just don't think we can know yet. I don't think... I think... <laughs> Like we talked about, if it was Matthew Stafford back there, do we think we'd be having this all the same conversations? Or if everyone was healthy that we, you know, hoped would be healthy, would we be having the struggles in the red zone that we've seen? And, and we wouldn't even be talking about Scott Turner. We'd just be talking yeah. about how we're 500 or better than 500 and how we're going to go into the last stretch of the season and kick Dallas's and the Eagles' ass. Um, I just think it's hard to know. It's really hard to know. And we it's also be, yeah. not not binary, right, John? Ward? It's not either bad calls <laughs> or bad execution. It's probably a little bit of both. I'm sure oh, Turner agreed. is. I'm sure yeah. Turner is trying to call plays that he knows Taylor can make. But there's certain things that that you can do, and there's certain things that the defense and the situation dictate that these are your best options, and you got to balance all that. Um, I, I, I said it earlier. I would love to see as much for my intellectual curiosity now what this guy could do Turner if just with Fitzpatrick who has an NFL arm he can't move but he's got an NFL arm what, what how different would the offense have looked we'll, we'll never know that well then we, then we I may know it this. we may know it in two weeks if he decides to start Kyle Allen then I ask you guys this how many times have we gone into this a game and, and seen something that works and then it disappears well, is that the defense making adjustments? No, because taking, taking I, it away? I, I will look back to the same thing. The first drive against Denver, McKissick was torching them. And then the second, third drive, the third drive, the fourth drive, McKissick's on the sideline. Oh, we've you know seen that. We have seen that. We've seen um, drives where we pounded it down their throat all the way down for a touchdown. And then we and try then to throw the ball. We get the ball back. We don't run it once. I mean, we have seen that. And I think right. it's a legitimate question. Like, and I think that was a Gibbs thing. Gibbs thing was, we're going to do, you know. What works. We're going to ch- do, what is it? What was the name of the play? The four, was it 40? Counter 40, tray. 40, 40 gotcha. Gotcha. Counter tray. We're going to do counter tray. And, or 40 and gonna, chip. We'll tell you we're doing it, and we're not going to stop doing it until you stop it. I don't know that that's Scott Turner's thing, but I do no, see that. I and that's, that's not today's NFL unless you got Derrick Henry. Which We're nobody happy. does, right? right but, but, well, but to that point, the Chiefs are running the same things over and over again. They're doing it out of different schemes to different guys because it's working. Well, teams are doing it against our defense. They're running the same play and scoring 75 yard touchdowns against us because it works and they know it works. I, I'm not I, saying, I, I'm trying to remember who it was I saw an interview with. It wasn't Gibbs that said this. It was somebody that had played for Gibbs or coached with Gibbs after they left the team. Gibbs runs like eight plays out, out of 15 of different formations, different formations, but they're right. just eight plays. 
you know, and so the team has mastered eight plays, but we're going to line up in multiple, multiple looks, and you're not going to have a clue what's going to happen because everything can be run out of anything. But, you know, I just, I don't know. I did me or Derek one brings this up every single week. Empty backfields. Third and two. I, I don't. That, that's not chess guys that's not and that's and you know I, my daughter walked in watching me I, Monday night I was watching the game Monday night sitting there and she walks in and she's looking at the game and she's like explain this to me and so I started talking and she goes this doesn't sound anything like soccer because she played soccer right I was her coach I said it's not she said well what is it and I said it's I said it's two organizations with a bunch of coaches that call the plays and effectively play live action chess with 11 players because the players aren't calling the plays anymore the players don't have to recognize anything until the ball snaps it is the coaches that set the strategy and i don't think scott turner's a chess player i think it's a fair criticism because it goes back to what derek and others have said that if you know that Heineke's inexperienced and is not perfect, you know, has some, some clear limitations, why are you putting it all on him in the most critical moments of the game? But I also think Mark has brought this up before. There is an advantage to an empty backfield, which is you have more people on the line. <laughs> you have more blocking and you have more uh, targets on the line. So it's not like it's insane to do that it's just that when you have a quarterback that can't consistently can't find the open guy it looks pretty stupid and so i think that's a fair criticism it looks well, really stupid when you run the ball with an empty backfield from first and goal on the one john that's my point it's it empty i'm, agree, I'm agreeing a, with your point empty, I'm just empty backfield it's has not. its place don't don't get me wrong it absolutely has its place but I don't understand why when you've got to get one yard and everybody knows you're going to run the ball, you remove everybody else from the backfield and, and give the defense the cue. Oh, or, or, you, the or, you sneak, sneak. or you sneak your six foot quarterback. <laughs> or, the other. Yeah. or the opposite. It's third and two at the 40 and you go empty set. And now you've just told the entire defense, half the playbook is out the window. They don't have so, to think about anything. They so can we've drop talked, back. Last year, we talked a lot about the team has to learn how to win. You heard a lot of that kind of talk. Like, is it is it unreasonable to say that the coordinators have to learn to win? Too? I know Scott, Scott Turner has been a coordinator a couple of games in Carolina last year, which was a disaster if you're an offensive coordinator, and then this year. And, again, I'm not, I'm not giving him a – pass because you don't get a pass in the NFL if you're in a coordinator position but he is pretty inexperienced so is it possible that he'll learn from what we've seen this year is that I hope so I hope so because I don't think the coordinating on either side of the ball has been good enough I can't imagine that that um Rivera has given him a, a man hug at the end of every game saying great job Scott I imagine there's some conversations going on like some pretty intense conversations. I'm just guessing because I've seen, I've seen video of Rivera behind the scenes and he is not the guy that you see at press conferences. The F bomb is flying. He's fucking fired up. (laughs) He does not mince words. I just think that's who he really is. I think press conferences is not Ron Rivera. I think he's a fiery guy and I don't think that's going to change. I don't think that has changed. So I have to imagine there's some, some pretty, energetic conversations going on when things aren't going well but uh, but all right are there any energetic conversations going on or are there any <sighs> instructive conversations going on you know uh, you can yell all you want you can drop all the f bombs you want but the bottom line is if nobody is offering some legitimate instruction here how's turner going to learn Cause I'm telling you, I don't, I don't see him learning from his own mistakes right now, guys. I see him making the same mistakes every week. 
I, I would have, uh, there are a couple of these plays I would have thrown out. I would have taken out of the playbook and never called again. And yet they turn up repeatedly. I, I don't understand. So but, that, I, you know, but then I'm also not, you know, a professional coach in the NFL either and hardly won any games with my little league soccer team. So maybe <laughs> I'm not the best guy to be judging things, right? It's not you. It's a, Damn little players that aren't doing I'm, what you're telling them. To do. I'm telling you, yeah, it's yeah, you know, a bunch it's of eleven year old girls. It, it what you is, say, Paul? You know, no, the, I was just gonna say that that I'm hearing the back and forth that you guys are having. You know, is it the players? Is it the coaches? That that two that two and six record is ultimately a reflection of the fact that this is on everybody in my mind. Um, we we got a lot of our best players from a year ago that are having down years with the exception of a few of them. And the fact is that our coaches, let's face it, as you guys have documented, the coaches are having down years as well. I, yeah. I would be interested in seeing how many screenplays we've called since Gibson went to the house from 75. I'm just, I couldn't name one in the last couple of games, at least not one that worked. Maybe we've tried it 15 times and it's failed. I may, and I'm missing it. I don't know. But was, was anyone else a little surprised that um, they're sticking with Heineke and that they're, I mean, pretty emphatically saying, no, Heineke's our quarterback? A little bit. I wondered if they were going to just look at Allen going two and six, season's basically over. See what you got. Let's have these guys compete for next year's backup job. You know, I hate that. I kind of like it though, Derek. I kind of like it a little bit just because I feel like that's the, Benching the quarterback is whether or not he deserves it or not is almost irrelevant. It it almost feels like you're kind of caving to the pressure of we're two and six and I've got to do something like, you know, cutting a kicker <laughs> and bringing in some, <laughs> it kind of feels like that. So I was kind of not that I, not that I'm, I have all that much faith in Taylor at this point, but I kind of like that. They're just saying, you know what? None of us are doing the job. We're not getting it done. Heineke is part of that, but he's not the only part. I kind of like that a little bit. I do too. I, I hope I, I I don't mind him getting the entirety of the season because you want to see what you've got with him. I think he's proven he's probably going to be he's probably earned himself a backup job in the for the better part of the next decade in the NFL. I don't think he's a starting quarterback, a consistent long term starting quarterback. As much as I love his story, I love the guy. I will forever remember alongside that over <laughs> there. You know what I mean? Like it's going it, to, it's, it's, it's now etched in my brain, but Let's talk about the quarterback thing a little bit. I, I was, I went and watched the condensed version again today and specifically really focused on, on Heineke and his mechanics what I'm seeing is a guy, and this is going to sound geeky, but he is not, his throwing motion and the way he's attacking with his arm is not like it was early in the season. He, he is guiding the ball a lot on a lot of, on a lot of his passes. He's kind of, it, it's a, like a mental thing. He's not sure about where he wants to go or he's being careful and protecting it. All of those are good things, but he is just not firing the ball. He, not on every pass. He still does it a few times. But if, if you feel like doing it, just look at his mechanics. And he looks to me like a guy who's trying really hard to be an NFL pocket passing quarterback. He's not attacking like he did early on when he was just balls to the wall, hair on fire, you know, trying to get his shot. That's not the guy that we're seeing right now. Um, and I'm really curious to see if, if I can see that. I guarantee you that the offensive coaches can see it and the head coach can see it. Um, I'm not, I, I said a, a week ago, I, I think he deserves the rest of the season. I kind of think that, that what we're seeing is, is Taylor Heineke. I think he'll get a little bit better. I never think he's going to make a big leap. I think this is who he is. I am not going to be surprised at all. If we see Kyle Allen, if, if Taylor has another couple of games, maybe even a half against Tampa looking like he has, where he can't put the ball in the end zone, I will not be at all surprised if we see Allen and Allen gets a similar shot to see what he's got going forward. I told you guys being a Carolina guy, I see, I've seen a lot of Panther games and they really liked 
Kyle Allen in Carolina. Um, I don't think they know any more than they know what Heine they probably know more about Heineke at this point. Than they know they a lot about yeah. Allen, than about Kyle Allen because Kyle Allen does have the physical. Kyle Allen and I know people people say Kyle Allen doesn't have a strong arm. That's a, that's totally wrong. Kyle Allen can sling the ball. And you saw it last year bef briefly before he got hurt. But yep. he, he he has an NFL arm. I just think the thing on I, uh, on Kyle Allen was he would throw a lot of – he would try to fit the ball into places where he had no business trying to fit it into. So he'd throw picks at inopportune times, and that's what, that's what got him benched in Carolina. But he's got the arm. He has a, a much better arm than Taylor Heineke does. It's just the decision-making. So – I, I wouldn't be surprised either. I was kind of surprised they didn't go to him. Sometimes, I mean, even just to say, look, you know, you know, Taylor, we appreciate what you've done. We just need to make a change and see if we can get something going here. It's not, it's not a statement on you and your effort, but I was a it's little surprised. like pulling a goalie in a game when you're down four right. to one to see because he's well, had two, he's had two bad games, and I'm a, I'm a Heineke fan. You guys know that, but he's had two bad games and two bad games. Can cost you uh, where we're at right now. I mean, it's a difference between. Well, last week we were saying if we win this one, <laughs> we're still in it, and now we're like the season's over. So it was a big game, and he did, he didn't get it done. Well, what I'm looking at is the last three weeks, our last three games of offensive output. We've scored 33 points in three games, 13, 10, and 10. That's not going to get it done. It's right. It's that red zone thing you were talking about. And you know, it you don't you don't put Kyle Allen in if, if Matt Stafford is the quarterback and he has two or three bad games and he's been your quarterback for 10 years, you're not going to, you're not going to bench him and put in the relief pitcher. Taylor Haneke hasn't earned that, that safety. He's, he's any more than anybody else on the team right now. I just, I, I still love the guy and I hope he's our backup quarterback for the next 10 years, but I don't, I think, I think you've kind of seen what he's got. Um, and I, Anyway, I'm just saying I'm not going to be surprised at all if we see Allen and, and sooner than later. Yeah, it's basically the same offensive staff here that they had in Carolina, right? Uh, not was even, there. A different old line coach, right? Uh, yeah, but I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Their, I don't know them all the, well enough. Yeah, um, I don't. I don't either. I mean, I'm looking at this right. Kyle Allen's got 17 career starts. 13 of those are in Carolina for his career. He's a 63% passer. He's averaging 6.9 yards per attempt, 23 TDs against 17 INTs with an 84.4 rating. He, that year, the last year in Carolina, he had them. I don't know. I don't, I'm not looking at pro football stats, so I don't know, but he had them like, eight and two or eight and three. I mean, they were on a tear in Carolina, but then he started throwing the picks and that's what got him benched. And that's the thing with college. And I mean, that's, that's the, the hang up on him is he'll, yeah, he can, he can, he can have those games where he throws four touchdowns and no interceptions, but then he's going to have those games where he throws three picks in a row. Wasn't Cam hurt touchdowns. that year too? He, yeah, he was. Reason. That's how he got his chance. But yeah, I mean, they could have stuck with him. I think they maybe should have stuck with him, but you know it's hard. It's hard to keep Kyle Allen, you know, in the game when you've got Cam Newton. If he's well, helping. and and then Kyle keeps getting hurt, right? And ever since then, every time right. he gets on the field, he can't stay on it for more than the game. Well, in DC, no, he played four <laughs> here. He played four <laughs> here, and the only reason he got hurt is Jabril Peppers leg whipped him and snapped his ankle. That was the only reason he came out. He was. He was looking I mean, strong. He, he there played was... 12 games in Carolina before he came to D.C., so that's more of a, a Washington thing. And the... To John's point, um, I think I, I might have been the Giants, but the, the, the play that I saw that made me realize that Allen does have an NFL arm, he was standing at about the 38-yard line, if I remember correctly, on his back foot with a rusher in his face, and he flicked the ball to McLaurin, and it went about 55 yards in the air, and he walked in for a touchdown. And that was when I was like, all right, this kid can throw the football. I I, I mentioned it. It might I, I might have been last podcast, maybe the podcast before. I said, when are we going to see Allen? Is it time to see Allen? Is it time to pull Heineke as a, in a relief situation and put Allen in there? And at this point, uh, now, 
we've shifted the ability, shifted the focus from from trying to win every game to if you're going to lose, lose with a purpose. You know what I mean? Well, so let's, yeah, let's talk about that. Maybe just, and we don't want to put everyone to sleep here. I know we've been on for what, an hour already, but so what, what are we thinking about for the rest of the season? Lose with a purpose at this point. And I'm not saying tank. What I mean by that is Jamin Davis better see 85% of the snaps on defense. You know what I mean? And, and and learn not to attack quarterbacks face masks with the crown of his helmet and get bad roughing the passer penalties. I almost jumped. I almost threw something yeah, at the was, screen. Uh, that and dropping the ball in your hand. That that my that was Bobby McCain. Yes. So so I mean, that that I, I I'll tell you right now. I'm just gonna say it. That guy is pack your shit up. Get off the field. Un- so clean out your locker and go because that's they, you cannot have players. That do that in critical moments. I'm sorry, That's my can't. point. Derek, teams- Derek Forrest, it just got activated off the IR. I want to see that guy on the field. Jeremy Reeves is on our practice court. I want to see that guy on the field. You know what I'm saying? I want if we're going to fa- have a season that is considered a failing season because we're not going to qualify for the playoffs at this point. Lose with a purpose. Learn what you've got. Develop who you have. I better see Chase Young in on every snap because I'm not you, saying I want him to get young, did you see them pull young off the field like several times in key drives and put James Smith Williams in there and oh he just happened to destroy the quarterback yeah I saw it so that's what I need to see for the remainder of the season if we're going to really take a look at what's going on I, I young better develop I want to see new pass moves. I just want to see improvement correct every week. Uh, and we're not seeing that right now I don't. Well, that's I'm not saying fair. it defensively. Yeah, the defense has improved. The defense has improved, but still. Well, so what? What's missing? The defense has improved, and we're still moving the ball on offense till we get in the red zone. There's one glaring thing that we need to work on for the rest of the year. Find a way to put it in the end zone. Sorry, go ahead, Paul. So is no, Thomas no worries. coming back soon? I think Thomas is coming back pretty quick. I think he could. He, I think he could be back against Tampa. They cut the guy. They I can't remember his name because it wouldn't hear long enough for me to learn his name. But they brought in a tight end, and then they or turn something burger. They cut him already. They released him. So I gotta think Logan Thomas is just like maybe one or two games from coming. Well, back. and Seals Jones, Seals Jones showed up. That guy has played far better than what anybody anticipated. He was supposed to be. He was supposed to be a camp body that You're was right. just. And he's ended up playing some legitimate football. So that that could be interesting to see if this guy could be a long-term TE2 for us. And then we don't have to – I mean, the story of Samus Reyes is great, but if you don't have to invest a roster spot on a guy like that for the long term, then so be it. So you said – one of you guys asked, what do we want to see the rest of the season? I'll tell you what I want to see. I want to see us spoil someone's season. <laughs> because that's all we have. That's all we have. I want to see us knock as many teams out of the playoffs as we can in the last four games because we're playing well. And it won't be Dallas, unfortunately, but maybe we can ruin someone else's season. I, I honestly think um, that there is a lot to play for this year. Not record-wise, not playoff-wise, um, but we really need to think big picture here. We all accepted the fact that when Rivera came in here, you know, we basically embraced the five-year plan. Um, And I think a huge, huge question that needs to be answered the rest of the way is if what we saw last year from a lot of our guys was their peak level. So for instance, our Chase Youngs, our Antonio Gibsons, our, our Montez Sweats, our Cam Curls, what we saw last year out of those guys Is that going to be the absolute max we're going to get out of them? We all assume that those guys were going to ascend this year. It hasn't happened. For this five-year plan to be successful, we need to be able to get more than what we got out of those guys last year. And I think that's a huge, huge question to be answered over the last eight or so games that we have here. Because the fact is that last year wasn't good enough. You know, we need to figure out who we're going to keep in here long term. And we need to figure out who needs to be kicked to the curb because the fact is we're just not getting it done right now. That's, that's fair, Paul. And I, and I would add to that. I think by and large, our team, particularly on defense early has been less than the sum of its parts. 
some of it is the individuals aren't up to it. And there's been a huge chemistry issue where guys are not playing together as a unit. Um, I fully agree. They're going to have to find guys that can not only do it physically and give you consistent week and week in and week out performance, but also integrate into a larger scheme, which it's been where what we've played eight games, the last two games, the defense finally started to look like it's playing together and you're starting to see some flashes from guys. So the, the less than the sum of its parts thing, it, that every time I watch this team play, that's what I keep. That's what I've been thinking all year so far. They just they're not playing as a as a team. The individuals aren't meshing. It, so it, I'll it, I will tell you a secret. Rivera is not going to fire his coordinators this offseason. So if I don't you think see you that should. on social media, you can just go ahead and discount that because it's not going to happen. Whether or not I think that's right or not, I do think it's right. Um, however, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure to like make some kind of a big splash change. But I don't think he will because that's just not his nature. He's going to ride with those guys. Um, if he ever parts with them, it'll be because one of them got a, you know, we had a really great season and one of them gets a job offer. It won't be because he's responding to criticism. So I don't think, I think people that scream for that, it's like you can scream for that all you want, but you're ignoring who Ron Rivera is. And he's not going to, to me, that would be throwing them under the bus for global lack of success that has lots of different factors involved. He's just not going to do that. I don't, I don't believe. I hope you're right. Cause I think that would be a big mistake. And who are those core players going to be? I, I just finished saying a few moments ago, you know, five-year plan. We're in year two of a five-year plan. Who can John you Allen, he just got inked up. Well, yeah, exactly. And, but And it's having a great year, by the way, after getting inked up. Absolutely. And th the thing is, outside of John Allen and Terry McLaurin, I don't know who you can say with confidence that you envision being with this team when they're ready to compete for a championship. Who's going to provide that consistency year in, year out, game in, game out? To me right now, those are the only two guys you can rely on consistently year after year, game after game. And, you know, the, the, the rest of the season, I think uh, uh, a very important aspect of it is going to be to identify who might some of those players be that we're going to want to carry with us and rely on going forward into the future. I think there are other guys like I think Gibson and McKissick are really good running backs. But the problem is some of those positions, the, what do they say, like three year, three to four years is a average uh, running back career, you know, at a top level. So that's going to be the dilemma is some of the guys that are are more of a bright spot right now. By the time we really get the roster where we, and we're in a position to make some noise, they're going to be aging out. So. I don't know. That's a good question, though, because there aren't that many. I mean, as you were asking that question, I'm like, damn, who would who, it, you know, I, I mean, Logan but, Thomas might be one of those guys if he's healthy. But who who else? Here's Logan's. Here's a little the thing, thing, though, to your point. Paul, here's the thing, mm -hmm. though, is I don't I don't as bad as it might feel right now. We're two and six. And as ugly as we might feel things, I don't think five years is the window. <clears throat> I think we're. 18 months from being quarterback. legitimate. Huh? Quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. That's what I'm saying. Is and I'm wondering, and I mentioned earlier what it would how do Ron and his crew see 2021. I'm wondering if the whole plan wasn't to be kind of where we're at, and then we go into this offseason, we make a play for a big name vet. Uh we've had Tom, my uncle on here, Tom Skins fan. And he called Fitzpatrick, and now I will give him credit. This offseason, he was beating the drum for Russell Wilson next offseason, that this was part of the bigger plan. And I more and more find myself intrigued by that. What would we be doing with Russell Wilson on this roster? I heard Andrew Luck thrown out there today. Yeah, I'm <laughs> dead. Get Andrew Luck. He hasn't taken a snap in three years. Well, that's a. I think that's about as likely as Russell Wilson. But I mean, everyone's intrigued by that, for God's sake. But it, I mean, the question is, is that is there a chance in hell of that happening? Uh, it wouldn't. Well, I don't. As bad as Geno Smith has been, and maybe Carroll 
and the crew up their caves. But at the same time, how old is Russell now? 30, 31. I think early 30s. Yeah. I think he's a little older than that. I think I you're think looking at about a three year window with, with Russell, maybe 32. But the larger point is 100. Right. Good God. Not nowadays. Three year window. No way. Yeah. If he's 30, he's got a good, if he's 32 or 33 already for a mobile run around kind of quarterback. Yeah, but <laughs> he's a run around kind of quarterback that never gets hit. hit. I love yeah. Russell Wilson. I, if I, I would. What are we talking about? We'd have to talk about what we're he's, giving up for him. Yeah. We're not, he, I'm not ready to go down 32. that road. He's 32 yeah. right now. Well, if it comes to it and we're talking terms, then then we'll, I'll have that conversation. I love the guy. I wish we had drafted him way back when. All we're going to be talking about in the offseason is his how the hell do we find a quarterback? That's all we're going to be talking about. I can but tell you right know, now, though, the draft, I don't think the draft is producing a quarterback that's going to take this team and put it over the top. Oh, it will produce a quarterback. We just won't be able to. I mean, our ability to find that guy. There isn't a quarterback. None of the quarterbacks in this draft class are going to be great quarterbacks. Well, Derek, there may not be an an Andrew Luck or a Trevor Lawrence, but there sure as hell going to be a Russell Wilson coming out in the third round, or a Ben Roethlisberger going at eleven. That's, okay, that's fair. But my point is, even if we're picking top five, there's there, there's no joke. There's no guarantee. There's I mean, no. We can there's ask no. Him for God's sake. Uh yeah well i agree i agree with you it's not looking like the experts aren't saying it's a big premium draft class i'd like ritter from the beginning that'll change so much by next april some of these guys one of these guys will rise up to be a sure number one win the underwear olympics i get it so let you know i saw somebody pining to bring that we or basically saying we blew it with dwayne haskins today i'm like oh my god i'm gonna lose my mind i cannot respond to this even well, like, well yes, I said that's, it, our, that's our institutional um, blinders is that we we gave up on Dwayne Haskins. That was that's the fatal flaw in this organization. Good. Job. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's what they were saying, that we should have yes. kept him and turned so we oh, shouldn't yeah. have given up on Haskins so quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Haskins gave up on Haskins. So you did. draft you draft a quarterback high every year and you bring in an, a veteran high every year until you hit on one. Because until we do, we are going to have this same conversation a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, when we're two and six. Look, I asked, I, I asked a trivia question during the offseason when we were talking, and I said, how many quarterbacks have the Washington, at the time, Redskins drafted since Tom Brady <laughs> got drafted? And how many have the Patriots? And it was the same number. Like, they had the greatest of all time. And they drafted the same number of quarterbacks that we did. And we have had more quarterbacks than outside of maybe the Browns. And I only think of that because I see that stupid jersey, the guy every every time he's on the NFL on Fox. The right. same guy with the same Colt McCoy jersey that has everybody crossed out. And I'm with you. I, I, draft a quarterback and sign a quarterback every offseason until you get your quarterback. And then so you after you one. do that, you keep doing it. And you keep doing it because you don't want to be Seattle like Seattle is right now, where Russell Wilson goes down and they have Geno Smith at quarterback. Why are you laughing? I'm laughing because someone, someone's wife is calling for him. Like, are, when, how long are you going to be on this thing? I got to tell you one, guys, you guys, one thing before we, before we wrap it up. I was fully prepared to not give any football commentary whatsoever because on Sunday I did not enjoy the game whatsoever. However, after the game, I made the like baddest ass batch of uh, brisket chili I've ever made. So I actually, oh. have, I was actually going to go through and ex- give everyone the recipe to my killer brisket chili. Nine, no Ninety football. minutes later, we're still talking. No, about no, that. no. It, it would have been it would have been more entertaining than talking about the game. No, I mean literally, we've been <laughs> at this for ninety minutes and nobody has <laughs> shut up through the whole thing. It's great. I know. So that's a credit to you guys. You actually got me talking about the game and the team. Um, which is tough to do sometimes, but well, I, I am I am going to post this on the podcast, the the brisket recipe, in case you don't want to watch talk about Washington anymore. <laughs> <laughs> word for word, sounds like a good uh, good overtime segment. All right, well, I guess do you guys want to take a crack at the next nine games that we're looking down the barrel of, or do you want to wait for next week to do that? Let's wait for next week. Yeah, let's talk about it next week. 
Well, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Uh, here's the only good news this weekend is we can't lose. Well, so all right, we're gonna we can't lose on the here. field. We could lose off what's, the field. What's everyone doing this weekend, man? It's a it's a football. It's a Washington loss free weekend. Working. What's everyone gonna do this weekend? Working. Oh come on, man! You're killing me. <laughs> I I wish I was kidding, buddy. I I honestly wish I was joking. Yeah. Probably spending the weekend decorating my house for the holidays. I have an entire shed of decorations outside that my wife is going to want put up. And my guess is this is the weekend since I'm in Virginia the following weekend. I'm going to do the most Canadian thing there is to do. Be at a hockey rink with my kids watching. I was going to say hockey has to be. (laughs) Nice. What are you doing, Mark? Mark, we can't hear you. Your microphone's off. This might, (laughs) God, I'm getting old. This might be the first weekend in 10 years that I don't have something on both days. I don't think I have anything officially on the docket for this weekend, and I'm loving it. I'll I'll, I'll figure out something. So I'm going to be winterizing, finishing winterizing my five surviving beehives. I'm going to make a barley wine, Bob. Nice. Um, that I've had the, the ingredients sitting around for a month. And then I'm going to put a bed together because we still have my kids' beds from when they were one year old uh, in one of our bedrooms. Martin knows because he slept in one of them at some point, <laughs> uh, with, probably with his legs hanging off the end. But we're going to put a, an, an actual adult bed in there. So Hey, I saw that bottle of liquor you had in your hand earlier, and you said Mark put a hurting on it. So I put at a that point – at that point, it had legs hanging off the bed is probably not a bad thing. Yeah, that was the least of our problems. That <laughs> I love you guys. Yeah. The team sucks, but they're still good right, things. Boys. Thanks, brothers. This makes it a lot more tolerable. That's true. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs>